Good evening. Welcome to Athens City Council. Tonight is Monday, April 14th, 2008. This evening, City Council is going to be meeting in a series of committee meetings, about five of them. It should go late tonight. Um, the first committee uh, to meet is the Planning and Development Committee. The Chair, Fourth Ward Committee, or Council Member, Debbie Phillips. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, the first thing on our agenda tonight is the um, Beaumont Green annexation and zoning. We, um, this is a process for folks who are new to council that um, goes through several steps when um, a, a new piece of property is becoming part of the city, being annexed into the city. Um, council, some time ago, um, passed a resolution saying that we would um, provide city services if the um, county released this um, piece of land for annexation. And then it went to the county and they took their action and now it's coming back to us and it, it actually has to sit um, kind of in the council office for a while before we even talk about it and that period of time has passed. So it's this, this multi-step process. But um, the point we're at now is that we do um, have a recommendation um, from the Planning Commission that when Beaumont Green is annexed, um, it should be zoned as R3. And um, we'll have a public hearing, as we would with any um, zoning change in, um, about the zoning recommendation. Um, currently, that hearing set for 7 o'clock on Monday, May 19th. Um, so we'll have the, the legal notice for that um, public hearing for people to have a chance to talk to us about the appropriate zoning. But um, we do have some representatives here with Beaumont Green, and I wondered if, if any of you wanted to just present very briefly, particularly because we do have several new council members, so they know um, where the property is and what's, what's there. Thank you, Councilwoman Phillips. Uh, my name is Frederick O'Remus. I'm a, a member of the Athens County Bar, and I'm here this evening with Jeannie Kenny from uh, my client's group and my associate, Ken Ryan. Um, we anticipated perhaps uh, answering any questions you might have for us this evening. I think everything has uh, gone along according to plan, and we should be positioned to complete the annexation and, and have the zoning approved. Uh, for your schedule. Rick, describe the uh, development that's planned there in brief, if you would. I might want to call Jeannie up to help me with this. <laughs> I'm Jeannie Kenny. I'm with the Woza Group. Um, we have a three-story, it's a senior community, 55 and older. We have 540 units, and it finished just this spring. And, um, I drove past it a couple of times over the weekend with some friends that was saying, why isn't it occupied? Why is it, you know, there does not seem to be a lot of activity there. Are there any? We currently have seven people, um, okay. yes, and there are several applications. They go through, and like I said, we just opened this spring. We just finished it up. And they go through um, a long um, application process, and it takes a while to get all the applicants to complete a, I think it's like a 10-page application. They do the background checks, uh, security checks, credit checks, and it, it takes a while to run the reports. You really don't see even one car. Actually, I was up there when I came through. There's like six cars there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a parking lot behind there if you drove in. There's um, the main entrance is on the top, and that's where it's at. Very good. Does everyone on council know where this is? No. Um, where is it? It's on the far east side. It's on Della Drive, just yeah. past the highway patrol. Very attractive. It looks very nice. It does. It looks yeah. really nice off Route 50. And, coming in. and we did have um, a development agreement with this project related to um, water. Uh, you may have heard some of the discussion that happened around this because they're actually in the Tupper's Plains area. Um, and Tupper's Plains um, wanted us to be able to provide emergency backup water to that end of their system. So we are providing city water, um, but we do have the capability to connect to Tupper's Plains and provide them emergency water if they would need to. So yeah, we did actually um, do a development agreement on this project. Um, any other questions? And I believe we can go ahead and start the 
Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, when is the public hearing again? May 19th. Okay. Um, sure. And I don't know where that puts us in the calendar. We could go ahead and start the readings, and the, the public hearing then will occur before we have our third reading. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I have two miscellaneous. Um, last week when I scheduled the meeting, I said, I know there are some other things we have to talk about, but I wasn't remembering right at that moment what they were. The first is the um, proposed rezoning um, down in the area of the old depot. Um, we did have a public hearing about that. Um, <clears throat> the plans have been sitting back on the table in the council office. I hope people have had a chance to take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> But would you want to present briefly to us about the project overall? And um, at the hearing, it was we more people had a few questions, but we didn't really get a chance to hear a presentation from the um, developer. Two plots. Two little squares. I am Margaret Schaefer, I'm manager of the Athens Station Project, and uh, we are requesting that the zoning for the property between the Athens Depot and Athens Station be rezoned to R3. We are proposing to build 18 units, a new building of 14 units, and an existing building of four units. The, uh, I'm, I'm sure you all know about Athens Station. We've been in the community for more than 24 years now. I feel we've been a good neighbor, and we have a good project. Um, it's a total of 18 units, and I kind of did a little math before I came up here because I thought maybe you might want to know. It would be um, in the new building. It's six two bedrooms and eight three bedrooms, and an existing bedroom, uh, building would be four two bedroom apartments and a total of 44 bedrooms and 44 bathrooms, and we have 39 parking spaces. Um, and there, did people have a chance to look at the plans, or do you want me to spread them out over here and be able to take a look at them real quick? Okay. Yeah. Um, I did bring a picture of... Uh, one of the buildings at Sycamore Place that this will be an exact, well, maybe not exact replica, but pretty much the way that building is built, if you'd like to see it. Okay. You can pass that along. Um, so the location of this, this is where um, Toscano's currently is behind the depot building in the old railroad right of way, and they're proposing to put some apartments in there and build one additional apartment building in that same right of way area. Um, and the land is currently zoned M, and the Planning Commission um, did pass forward a recommendation to us to consider rezoning it to R3. Um, questions? Thoughts? I know um, a couple weeks ago, Member Bain found some of the documents from the initial approval of the planned unit development that is, is currently there um, because part of this property is city property that's leased by the station project and um, the overall project was a, a planned unit development so the underlying zoning was never really changed to reflect um, what has been built there. So that's why this is really coming back to us. Nancy, do you have any? Well, I fundamentally would like to have the front area zoned open space, um, and I'd like to have a, an appropriate type of parking facility developed there as long as we're going to give this concession. But, um, you know, I got my request in too late. Um, I'd like to know, I guess, what would be the maximum number of units we could put on this spot? And I would also like to know, because we'll never see this again, <coughs> I do have some, some, and 
I know Margaret, and Margaret did not lead us astray. There is no relationship between the parking in front and this development. But I would like to know if she were going to max it out, how much would it be? How many spaces? Because we're short, it seems, a few spaces as it is. Um, and my other fundamental problem is, and it's probably because of um, the environmental assessment, but it seemed to me that if the historical society was came down in favor of the development of the station project because of the significance of the um, station itself. I would like, and since um, historic preservation generally talks about the area roughly a, oh, a fourth of a mile around um, any facility, I guess I'd like to know, I'd like to be sure that there will not be an adverse impact of such a development on the station, on the visuals. Because we have, I guess, struggled with this for a long time. So, you know, you've heard me talk about this before. And it's nothing, I mean, I don't have any problems with the station project itself, but I want to make sure that we're not adversely impacting the station. Because, and I know this, the whole history of this tract of land is murky and amazing, but anyway, I don't know how that factors into this, but the open space I may be alone on. But um, when, when you say the land in front, how much of the land in front are you? All the of it? City the city land. It's all city land, yes. and it's all, it's all. So from where the railroad crossing used to be Mr. all the way up to Depot. Yeah, East. if you look on that map, you'd see Mr. Tremblay owns the area mm -hmm. around the station, and then the rest of it, where the 501 drive through and other bonded station, other wonderful landmarks were in the day, back in the day, and it looks pretty rough there. I don't so, think it will, yeah. On the, um, a, a, attached to the recommendation from the Planning Commission, there is a plat map that shows the, the parcel, and it looks like the, the entire front area between um, the old railroad right-of-way and West Union is City of Athens property. I believe Mr. Trimbley I, owns the He station. owns the, the, the depot portion. Yeah, okay. Yes. Well, that's, that's, one that's three just three not on this. 1.03 acres. 1.7 is what it looks like or something like that. I just, you know, I, that's my tricky thing. And it does look pretty good down there, and a tribute to Mr. Tremblay's uh, design people, and I hope this, I don't know that this will look that much different. The new ones he put in after the railroad went out of business are fine. So I guess my question is whether, are you talking that he owns this parcel? No, we own the parcel, but we but leased he, it to him for a dollar a year. So we've parking. leased it to him. So if yeah. we wanted to um, amend the, the zoning recommendation and zone that area open space, we're talking about our own property and not mm -hmm. someone else's property. That we right. have leased. That we have leased, yes. Okay. For parking, which would yeah. be allowed in an open space area. Right. Bill. I... Where angels fear to tread, here I go. Uh, Margaret and I remember each other from a long time ago and other battles that I've had with this development, Mr. Trembley. And uh, I, too, want to mention that the uh, train station looks very nice now. I'm very pleased. And the work that's been done on the inside, I understand, is just incredible. And everybody uh, should be commended. Uh, although I was part of a uh, citizen's referendum to uh, uh, quite a number of years ago to stop three more buildings that was going to be built in that front yard. It was not going to be built on city property. Those were proposed to be built on the Athens Station depot lot itself that was going to block the depot, the view of the depot from the street mm -hmm. is my understanding now. I haven't looked at Okay. I, I don't know what everybody understood, and but I, it and was I really don't to want the to, side. Yeah. It was never in the front. And Nancy, I don't know if, I mean, I might not know what I'm talking about, but probably know ever you. since I've been there for 25 years, I've always understood that the, park, the, the lots in front owned by the city was to be for parking. It wasn't yeah. to be built on. So there won't be any problem with the But we did have a proposal come to us that included using that or changing that. It's in the packet. Of right there it is. Yeah. Um, and that created quite a furor and uh, quite a uh, 
knock down, drag out uh, fight on council that ended in 4-3 with uh, Mr. Trembley winning, but then it going to referendum and Mr. Trembley losing. And uh, literally what went before the citizens of Athens was, should this be kept uh, manufacturing or should it be changed to residential? Right. And the citizens of Athens really, after a lot of money was spent uh, in a knockdown, drag out fight in the city, voted to keep it manufacturing. <coughs> Um, I agree with Nancy. I would like something that would keep open the viewscape, the green space, if at all possible, possibly limit the amount of parking because, again, we are renting to Mr. Trembley uh, land for a dollar a year for which he is then able to sublet out to rental parking for what is your parking rate down there, Margaret? It, where the, in the empty lots mm -hmm. in front, we haven't used that in a long time. We did rent out some parking years ago, and I do think it was before he proposed the other. But anyway, it was rented out to the neighborhood. Well, it was rented out mm -hmm. to whoever. But uh, be all that as it may, I like Nancy's ideas. I think we probably do need to come to some final solution and resolution on this and to put it to bed one way or another and if uh, I will not be voting or taking a side on this but uh, just to try to give new council members some long uh, history over what has happened down there uh, at one point the citizens of Athens spoke quite resoundingly and how they felt about changing the zoning mm -hmm for whatever that's worth to you. And uh, uh, I, I'll leave it at that. Well, and then the other thing you have to say, Bill, as well, is that the, cities, the citizens of Athens spoke resoundingly in favor of it when, when it was first starting. They were really... Yes, absolutely. I mean, there was a strong oh, support. I also go back long enough to remember what was there before the apartments were built. We had children. And folks, <laughs> the first it was a rat-infested uh, junkyard. Right. It was absolutely horrific. So let that be on the record also. Okay. And then I have a question um, probably for um, the mayor or for Paula. Um, when this, if, if the zoning change happens and the, the project comes through, then would this be a planned unit development? Would this come under Title 41? Would this be a, a proposed <coughs> revision to an existing planned unit development? Do you know how um, you plan to handle this? The discussion, um, this, some of this discussion took place at the uh, Planning Commission already. It would not be part of the old plan unit development. It would come in as a separate plan unit development. The discussion was at one point to call it uh, under Title 41. Uh, again, looking at the parking mix, it probably wouldn't fly under Title 41 unless we guarantee a variance, which really is under PUDs. In terms of the square foot area, uh, if you remember, PUDs are limited to two acres, and therefore that would be the variance required but it would give us more flexible. But as I say, right now, we're talking about, what, 44 beds and 31 parking spaces? No, 39. 39 parking spaces, okay. Not a single building. So that gives you an idea. There is a, a problem with that right off the stop. Right. right. And right. there are two Minor buildings, one. so... What? If there are two buildings in the plan, so then it would be a PUD. It would fall into PUD, it, yes. Okay. That would be the intention, how we look at it. I just was trying to visualize how this is going to work in terms of process um, because if we if we want to modify this and look at zoning the front portion open space um, getting some input about um, any adverse impact in terms of historic preservation and um, fixing up the parking in front maybe with some landscaping that issue of the parking and the landscaping maybe could be handled more Separately. as a PUD mm -hmm. process and we could just look at the zoning question um, in what we do here, I do I do feel strongly that since it is one of our his is it's a historically significant building that we need to ask either the planning commission or somebody to get the input of a person who has skill in that area. I'm not one, I'm not the one, but I do think that you know the the blending and the lo location is important. Okay. Because um, we put federal money, a million dollars, came into it to do this. We that's how it got cleared and put into one parcel. And I don't I don't expect it's going to cool the deal. I just think it, we need to ask when we're dealing with something that's that close to 
a major landmark in the city, we have to follow some kind of protocol. Nancy, the one other thing that I'd kind of like thrown out here for at least some thought to be given on it. As I remember the original debate, of course, people lined up at the microphone. This was even before I was on council and had very strong feelings about it. So we are going back a ways on this, a quarter of a century, I believe, at this point. But having economic development down there and having that as part of the linchpin of the west side revitalization was a big part of it. And we're going to be losing a restaurant in favor of apartments, if I understand what you want to do here correctly. Uh, those are jobs. That's a business. That is, you know, economic activity going down on <coughs> that's not going to be there again. And the proposal that I mentioned that caused all the brouhaha also had three apartments going in the historic train depot. So, you know, I, I'd sure like to whatever the resolution that comes out of this, is that what we want? And if it is, okay. You know, if it isn't, then, you know, maybe this package should speak to that one way or another. Uh, can, can I say something? Please. First of all, the apartment building is not going to be in front of the depot at all. Right? Yes. Okay, it's going to be behind it. Um, the, um, it, I have a, a, the zoning, what the zones are now, and it's surrounded by R3 and R2. It, it, it is residential down there. It is close to downtown. Um, we're surrounded by, how, by houses that are now turned into rentals. It's not going to be a project that is going to be stuck, tucked back in some small neighborhood with no streets in and out and uh, causing a, pro a parking problem in the area. I would just like to point that out for you. Um, and as far as the, uh, the front parking, the front lots, that has always been reserved for parking. There's never been anything said about any building anything there. We would, uh, Mr. Trembley has talked about and has been looking into, and I don't know if he's going to be able to, but he would like to put a train engine out front. Because the old, we found the old curb, because there used to be railroad tracks in front of the depot, and and then along and behind where it used to be. So he would like to bring in some rails and put a railroad uh, engine in front of the depot. And that would not be incompatible with open space, right? Yeah, well. Um, from my uh, the way I understand code and everything like that is to change it to open space up, up to the planning commission to do that. We could add it as part of the mix along the way. Um, if I remember looking at some of the history, and I think I've, I've run across some bundles of you know files and stuff like that, there was discussion one time of uh, some train stations there for restaurants. If you remember to the oh yeah yes to that would be the depot side of the street, the depot street side of it. If you remember so. Um, uh, the question I have, are you talking about using the parking front as part of the required parking for these apartments? No. Mm -hmm. no. no. It would be separate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just wondering. Yeah. So separate the open space question from the other one. But I'd like to know how many of Because they're going to do a um, site plan review. I guess it doesn't matter. I think it's going to be a planned unit development is what <coughs> we're hearing. So it will come back. Okay. Um, I... Would it be um, acceptable to folks if we go ahead and move this forward with um, some, I, I hate to do things with conditions, but if we say um, that um, we would also have a request about rezoning the city property as open space, that we would um, request some evaluation in terms of um, impact regarding historic preservation and um, something about, you know, fixing up the, the parking in area in front, some either landscaping or making it more usable. Um, attractive. And attractive. Yeah. Even um, with a tree. Yeah. If the zoning does change to an R3, uh, what would it take to turn 
the historic train station into apartments because again we saw that before. It's, it's still it's outside the parcel. Okay. It is still zone manufacturing. Okay. We're not okay. asking to Got change it. that zone. Just, just that. that. Okay. Right. So it would not change the zoning where the depot building itself is. Right. I would recommend if you want to have the front portion turned to open space, make a resolution to, to send it to the planning We're separating commission. the two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of the uh, landscaping, I guess the next thing to do is look at the landscaping ordinance and see what would fit in. Any type of improvement in a parking lot of that size would probably require some landscaping. And then it's up to the tree commission to determine that. Could we request somewhere in there, maybe in the resolution about open space, that you know the the landscaping and and whatever is going to happen in in the front be should that be part of the PUD application so that the thing comes through together? Um, what do people think about the best way to? I, I just I don't like completely breaking it apart because I think in some people's minds it it works if it happens together. Yeah, wow. Okay, realize what you're doing right now is you're changing the zoning from, um, you know, manufacturer R3. The next process would be PUD, which would require three readings as well, uh, and possibly a public hearing, I believe. At that point, if we start rezoning for open space in the front, somewhere along there, they'll start, in, you know, you'll have three readings of each. The PUD will somewhere along the line, in theory, match with the open space. If it not, you can always stop it. Uh, the other question I would have is, um, in terms of historical um, purview or review, uh, who would you want to do that? Do you have uh, any ideas? No. Okay. Mary Ann Peters, maybe. Who now? Mary, Mary Ann Peters. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I, I, we've tried to, one of the things we're trying to do with the comprehensive plan is find somebody who could help us with a with an ordinance. Okay. I called OHS, Ohio Historical Society, or Debbie did. Mm -hmm at my request, and we weren't able to find the assistance we needed. Maybe we can get it this way. Isn't that right, Debbie? Yes, right. that's correct. So, um, um, I just have a couple of thoughts. I mean, mm -hmm. the housing down there, I think most people would, would agree the that's housing good. that exists now looks very nice, and, and it's, it's worked out great. I have serious problems, though, with zoning out of existence a small, family-owned local business, and, and that's where I have an issue with, with this project. That, okay, that is not a family-owned business. Mr. Trembley owns that property. He owns that building. The Sparhawks just manage the restaurant. They don't own it. He owns the name. That's news to me, actually. Okay. And, I, and, I, and the Sparhawks do a beautiful job, and Toscano's has been, um, you know, it's been a very nice restaurant, and I, I know you all hate to, see, to lose that. Um, but restaurant business is hard. It's tough. You don't make a lot of money. So. What, um, you showed us a rendering of what the big building would look like. What's planned for the Toscano's area? It's going, it's going to be the existing footprint of that building, just one story, and probably keep the same design because it, ha it was designed to blend in with um, the, the train station and the apartments. Okay. So it would, you know, just be. Uh, it's, it's just going to stay one story, mm -hmm. yes. basic design. Right. But that's fine. Mm -hmm. Well. What would folks like to do? Well, I, I appreciate what the mayor said about really the, we are talking about two different issues. Um, but I hadn't realized that the zoning and the PUD are going to be two different issues requiring two different votes. And at, at some point, if we decided to go ahead with this rezoning, the front part is open space, they could merge. Or, or at least be on the agenda at the same time, so we could we would consider them as one affects the other. But I mean, I I, would, I was having a problem seeing how we were going to get this open space designation connected with this request. Separate them. But I think we can physically bring them together. 
time-wise? I think one of the reasons it seems a little unusual process-wise is that a planned unit development basically um, is a tool that's used to give you a little bit more flexibility than traditional zoning. And so when you approve a planned unit development, it's basically a zoning overlay. And it kind of supersedes the, the underlying zone on the property. So if it's going to be handled as a planned unit development, it would come to us, regardless of the underlying zoning, with the proposal and a list of whatever variances would be required for it to work in, in the base zone. Um, so it could be handled without a zoning change at all if it's going through the PUD process. Yeah, uh -huh. If you feel uncomfortable about the disconnect between open space and the, uh, the rezoning of this, you could always wait until the open space gets put in place. In terms of the uh, PUD being set down on the manufacturing, uh, I've never been comfortable with that in the past. Um, my big, in fact, I have a problem with dropping PUDs in anything except R3s from my point of view, or maybe the, the B zones. And, and I say that because uh, when I first saw this legislation coming through for PUDs, I, I visualized waking up one morning, finding somebody combined three lots in my neighborhood and dropped the PUD in it without regard to any zoning whatsoever. Um, and that is a concern I have. Uh, it does, does give you flexibility, but how much flexibility do you want to give it? I mean, does this mean I can take a PUD and drop it in an open space? No. Well, right, you're shaking your head no, but if it's just an overlay, it's an I don't overlay. Want to, I don't think, I think we need to rezone it myself Okay. from the cleanliness point of view. How about to keep it together, though? If it's going to come through as a PUD, can we, um, it sounds to me like, you know, there, I share um, Elahu's concerns about Toscanos also. I want to be clear about that. But um, I've heard that they may be looking at some options to be able to keep things going in, in some format. So um, I wonder if we could hold on to this until the PUD and the open space recommendation comes back from the Planning Commission so that they could go through concurrently. Um, okay. if, I, I don't think we're under a specific requirement in terms of time in which to act on this recommendation. So if we put on um, next Monday a resolution, a one reading resolution requesting that the Planning Commission um, look at the, the open space question, and then um, whenever the Planning Commission is ready to look at the, the planned unit development and make a recommendation on the planned unit development, it could all go through at the same time. So we don't have one piece and then waiting. Sometimes when things get disconnected, people don't, things can get lost in the mix sometimes. Would it be okay with everyone if we hang on to this so that all the pieces of it go through together? Do you, will that work for you? Um, if that's what's going to work for you, I guess that's what we have to do. Okay. Is, is it okay? I mean, I think the Planning Commission has to have some assurance that we're going to make it an R3 or they might balk at it at, at putting a putt in an M zone, right? What? Never mind. No, I was confirming it. Whether the Planning Commission gains reassurance from us that we'll, con we'll do the rezoning when the PUD proposal comes through. Well, it would be contingent on it, but again, if, you're, if your interpretation of PUD is such that you can drop it in manufacturing, then, you know, we'll see what I don't happens. think our interpretation matters as much as the planning commission's. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, and historically, it seems to be able to go wherever it chooses. Oh, at least noticed. from the previous. We, notice we were just hoping it was going to be different. Right. I, I'm hoping it's going to be different too, but I want to go in. Given the fact that there are several things at play here, I think it would work better if it all comes through together. So, but. I'm sorry, you kind of lost me back there. Are you going to go to the Planning Commission to keep it an R3, to make it an R3? Because they've already heard that. Right, or no. make it a PUD. The, I mean, I'm just. The open space, okay. um, we can request that the Planning Commission look at open space for that mm -hmm. other parcel. Mm -hmm. um, the Planning Commission can um, look at your PUD application whenever you're ready. If you, I don't know if you filed the papers for the, the actual project yet or not. No. But um, then whenever the Planning Commission sends that on to Council, 
So then when we get the open space recommendation and the PUD recommendation, we could do council's three readings for all of those pieces together. So you're going to, you, you, the, the lot in question, make it part of the PUD or rezone it to R3? That's my question. I don't know. The way I'm understanding what they're saying is that uh, they're going to hold off until the open space rezoning comes okay. in front of them, okay. as well as you submit a PUD to the Planning Commission, the Planning Commission will submit it to them, mm -hmm. and they're going to see all three pieces of legislation at one time. If I understand your... If we do the rezoning without a specific plan in front of us, then, you know, you could put anything you want in there. You know, like one giant building, right? I mean, it could go through site plan review. So well, that's what we don't. We don't want to think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. if if we um, if if all of the pieces can move through together, so everybody knows exactly what the project is that we're talking about, I think it will answer you know some of the concerns and questions that are okay. here. If we did just the rezoning on its own without these other things, it'd be hard for us to guarantee that those other things were going to happen. Mm -hmm. Lose control. So, okay. 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 Thanks, everybody. Oh, Jim. Could I ask that our resolution have House Members Bain's language in there about asking for a historic review at some point before it comes back for a vote? Yes. So we have assurances that it's yeah. compatible. Okay. Um, I have one other miscellaneous item for planning and development. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have an email here from Steve that contains a long string of emails back and forth about tickets that are issued by the code office um, that I think have been collected by the police department and they, um, I think they issue tickets for parking in the front setback. The code officers themselves can write these tickets and it's an administrative fine. Um, but then they get handed over to the police department. Um, but the fine amount doesn't match um, what we, when we made changes in the, the fines for different parking violations, the administrative violation fine is not the same. And to get everybody on the same page with that and make it easier for ad administratively for them to deal with collecting these fines, um, they've requested that we look at the section in, gosh, 230802, administrative fine, so that would be in the zoning code, may be paid within the first five days and a fine, um, so they want to make it $30 to match what the fee would be if the police issued the ticket um, and increasing to 40 if it's not paid within five days. Um, but that's in the zoning code. Do we need to send that to the planning commission? Yes, we do. Okay, so <laughs> then we'd be making a recommendation to the planning commission that this administrative fine that's in the zoning code match the same fee, the fine amount um, as it would if a police officer wrote the ticket. So, um, is that okay with everybody? We'll have a resolution next week to do that. And there's another piece in here tweaking the language on the development permit um, fee. And is this a current change that is being yes. recommended? Okay, this is a different piece and it's not really talked about in the whole string of emails, but the current language is permit required um, $70 review fee and they just want to change it to development permit. They're not talking about changing the amount, but just calling it a development permit. So. Okay, if we go ahead and make that change. And that is in Title 25, so we can just have that up as an ordinance for first reading. Okay. Does anybody else have miscellaneous for planning and development? Okay. Um, just one, uh, naming the streets. Council right. does naming the streets, and there has been discussion about the uh, street you accepted, the access road you're accepting. And there was Right. You guys can think about it. Is this a P and D thing or a transportation thing? I would try to say it's planning development. I mean, if you're going to name a street, okay. There is some section of code about which way, what you name, lane versus boulevard, depending on east to west or north to south. But I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, Margaret thinks she's so, getting out of here. So, <laughs> well, look at all those reporters. <laughs> there they go. Um, so, Good, I can ask my question. Nobody will answer. Frequently. <laughs> now, if you really want to call it. <laughs> Frequently, when there are new streets, they're part of like a subdivision, and the person who owns the property and wants to subdivide it already has names on the plat, you know, of what all the streets are going to be called, and we're just asked to accept it. But with the um, the access road um, that we that the ARC money is helping with, we actually get to name the street. So there have been a couple suggestions. Nancy Bain Street. Thank you. <laughs> no way. Um, <laughs> Do we just want to have like a brainstorming session sometime? I don't know. Really, we've never had this discussion in a committee meeting before. Yeah. Do I you want to? Years ago, Howard Stevens was stuck with this on his committee. Door one. As, uh, it was, and uh, so he wanted to name it after the family that had lived there for many years. And they raised great objection to it, so he had to pull the ordinance. <laughs> and he found that a family that used to live there and was not around and able to raise objection <laughs> uh, found this street named Door after them. So don't think that people always regard it as an honor to get a street named. Oh dear. Oh, wow. <laughs> one, of the, one of the other conditions, of course, is that we eventually have to check with 911 service to make sure it doesn't overlap with some other street. Yeah. Um, they have some, in some cases, they have the final word for something like this if you're going to have two of the same streets so there's no confusion where you send the uh, emergency vehicles. Is there any particular time in which we have to have this decision made? Not really. Andy's been asking about it just because he's tired of calling it like holes your drive or because it'll get stuck that yeah, way. Yeah, right? get stuck with that. He's afraid it's going to get stuck with something like that. So, uh, well, and given that more than one business is out mm -hmm. there, yes, that's precisely the point. So, just you know, I don't think there's any real you know speed to doing it, but eventually you'll need something to call that. Okay, <laughs> I like the idea of a brainstorming session where we can share the guilt. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to pay to have it done. It's just your name. All right, well. What about Barrett Drive? Oh, that's a good idea. Well, you know, the suggestion was made that something, mm. we need to name something after him. But the person who suggested it thought it should be a larger street than that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, we don't, or well, I guess we can change names, too. I'll <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so they, let's think about it a little bit and um, just just ponder and we'll figure out a, a process. I don't feel ready to go into that right now. <laughs> okay, any other miscellaneous for planning and development, Nancy? Um, I'd like to ask the mayor where along the way when we have a, a tap fee, where is it collected? At what point in the process? It's supposed to be collected before you open up the taps. Okay, and is there any way we can move it forward? I mean, move what forward? Back, back. I mean, you know, so it's known in advance once you. Um, I just was wondering about taps. Are you talking about the general. level, the, the price of the tap? Yeah, fee? the price. Um, that you would sign off on it when you accepted the permit, sort of thing. Your tap fee will be this. Your building permit fee will be that. Blah blah blah. Okay, I'll check on that. Uh, I was under the impression most of the time the tap fee, of course, is, would be occurring almost at the same time if you say, I've got so many units, because then you're looking at... I would think so. Yeah. You're looking at meters and, and drains at that mm -hmm. point. I think that's... Uh, but I don't really know um, when it gets put in the formulation. I know there's been some questions on what the tap fees are, but... Right, and I was thinking maybe if it were earlier rather than later, then the obligation would be clear to everyone and they wouldn't go through... I mean, this is new. I'm not asking for instantaneous decision, but it just seemed to me that some, it's not a shock, I don't think, but if, in case it is. It should be a shock. I think most buildings that are being built, they do want water and sewer. I would think, okay. yeah. Okay. I just think the amount might be a shock. Um, they can good. look up the... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so then the other thing, question before Bill asks is, is <laughs> um, if it happens that um, the summit is... Um, and dare I even say that name? The summit is going to be 
built by um, the old group um, or even the new group, are we still trying to collect the old engineering fees from earlier permutations of the summit, especially since the new holder? I mean, I, I was assured by Richard Kirk when he was speaking to us before he became a one man, a one building man, um, that he was going to pay all of those costs. As it stands now, when uh, Burgess and Nigel does the review um, process, they send us an invoice. It's paid. We forward an invoice to the developer. So right. those, are, those have been ongoing. Way before this, um, when Dowdy was in charge, um, there were bills incurred that were not paid. And I'd like, okay. yeah, we I mean, it's, we we're talking about a substantial amount of money. And I'd like to see, I'd like to see that um, at least reviewed because I know Richard Kirk knew about it. And I, before he was a one building guy, he talked about it because the other entity was his partner in this. My understanding is that they may be the new main person. Or I don't know. But they do owe us a considerable amount of money for earlier engineering work, checking out the various 50-foot retaining walls and such like. I would assume that all that all have been paid now. Oh, I don't think that's a safe assumption. <laughs> Kathy, is there a way to check on that? I think Ray knows, Ray actually, because he was yeah. the one charging. Well, okay. He might, but it'd be through the utilities billing department for collecting and engineering fees. And that would be under what refunds or it, professional right. services yeah. or. Well, I don't want you know. I don't want to. It's yeah, not it's important. No. Okay. Can you tell me later? Yes. I mean, like some meeting in the future, okay. before before we actually see any blasting, <laughs> they should be paying those old um, fees that they incurred for checking on the various hairbrain permutations. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> no. um, in terms of blasting, we did send them a letter saying their blasting <laughs> permit had expired. They responded to a letter to Pat Lang saying that they don't need a blasting permit anymore. Mm -hmm. um, they can do what they want or something like that. Some oh, well, that's there. wonderful. Uh, well, I guess something about that we can limit their sale and use of it, but uh, or sale and possession of explosive, but we can't legislate. It's kind of a confusing letter. It did make sense to me what they're trying to tell us. So I have to talk to Pat about that and see what that means. Exactly. Okay, well, my, my point is much smaller, but I do know yes. that was great. The, the checking on those old retaining walls. Oh. The, the cost of those, doing the engineering on those, which... And the water tunnels. And the water tunnels, all the other things that we, you know, we sort of fronted. Okay. Mr. President. No, I, the point I was going to make is long past. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> we get the payments in our office, but I don't know if that's the, what they were invoiced. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't know. So I don't know. I can tell way you before they paid, but I can't tell you if that's the full amount they were supposed to pay. So. Kathy, I believe it was before your time even. Yeah. I think you were yeah. down there. <laughs> Okay. Well, they, you'll check into it. We'll and get I'll, I'll ask questions. Um, Thank you. Any other miscellaneous for planning and development? Okay. We're adjourned. Chris, show sure. time. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have the Transportation Committee tonight, and we have three agenda items as well as any other miscellaneous items that people might bring up. The first agenda item is the Business Community Fair that uh, was held last Amanda. year, I believe, for the first yes. time. And we, um, Amanda Eastock from the Student Senate is with us here tonight to uh, present some information about last year's fair and then to ask us about a street closing for next year's street fair. Last time I was here was October of 2006. So um, again, I'm doing this again. And I did bring. Um, packets of information, not a lot, and there they were, the first few pages, two pages were from slides. At the actual presentation that I brought last time I was here, I just modified it a little bit. Oh, but you know, do you mind if I steal a copy? <laughs> so that I can follow along. <laughs> But the reason I'm here is first to, again, explain what we did last year and what occurred in the, uh, it actually happened September 8th. And then um, also I'll go into what I'd like to see happen for this year, um, specifically also in September, but a different date, but we'll get into that. Um, the mission that we've always, that Student Senate has always had, specifically for my commission, is that I found when I took the position that a lot of the students at Ohio University don't really venture off campus away from, as far as um, businesses that we that Athens 
you know, has like restaurants and the little trinket shops that we have, not just on Court Street, like the, you know, the neighboring streets that we have and even some of the neighboring areas, a lot of our students don't get a chance to see, you know, where or what those businesses are. So um, we're just trying to increase awareness. And the easiest way that I thought that could happen is by bringing the businesses to the lazy students. So <laughs> I figured that almost a street fair venue would um, serve the best purpose. Now, how we did it was, um, well, why a fair? Obviously, it was because you know that's free advertising for businesses to a possible 20,000 students, and we thought that might be a great incentive um, for businesses to kind of um, come as well. So I've been working with the Chamber of Commerce, and Larry Payne specifically has been helping me with the project. And um, last year we had over 60 businesses in attendance. That reg We had actually 67 that registered with me, um, actually all the way up until the day of. I had set dates to where registration would stop, but it got to a point where I was just accepting, you know, anybody who wanted to come. Um, I had six no-shows, so it was about 61 tables that were actually filled. And um, again, it was on sub Saturday, September 8th. We did it from a tw time span of 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, but the street was closed from 11 to 4, so they allowed for, or I believe it was even closed at 10 o'clock. But um, it allowed for some cleanup and um, setup and cleanup time, which actually we only ended up using maybe a half an hour of it. The cleanup was, or the setup was ridiculously fast, and the cleanup was the businesses took down their things and folded up the tables, and then the tables were taken away. And I think that even lasted maybe 15 minutes. <coughs> so um, it was a very easy event to hold. Uh, as far as costs go, the Student Senate covered the cut. Cost of tables it ended up being around six hundred dollars, give or take a few. I believe six hundred three point ninety nine. Um, and the price, I don't know if this city actually in incurred any costs, but Ray Hazlitt um, quoted to me that it may have cost around two thousand dollars to close the street for the parking spaces. So I just included that there to remind you know myself and you that there might have been a cost to city council. Um, but last year it was agreed that if, or it was, I was told that if this event proved to be worth having, um, that we do it again, um, and that would be the cost that the city may incur the second time. And that would be great, because Student Senate picks up all the costs of advertising and marketing of the event. And this year, what I'd like to see different is more focus on advertising to students, and that's going to require a lot more money, because we have a lot more ideas. Um, we're going to actually start advertising early also we're going to start in May and then go all the way until September um, even drop some little things to our summer students if we can um, we did a lot of work um, we, we did put a lot of work into this to see if this um, businesses were actually interested in participating um, we did business call logs where we called about 200 businesses um, to see if they'd be interested and we did get really good feedback a hundred showed interests 40 40, only 40 said they were not interested, but we still didn't get a chance to talk to 60 of them. But the businesses that did attend said that, um, majority of them said that they would do it again. They would like to see it happen every year as well. Um, student Senate did pass, is spon it is a Student Senate sponsored event. We did pass a resolution. It's there in fine print, but I do have the larger print that if you care to see it, I could pass it around, but it just basically says that Student Senate <coughs> likes the idea, we support it, and um, it's going to happen. Um, now, the new date, what will be different is the new date is September 20th. We're pushing it back a little further into September um, simply because we don't want it to fall on a home game for Ohio University. Uh, we'd like to see the students attend. And um, we're also pushing back the time from 1 o'clock to 4. The reason is because we felt, um, I don't know, that 12 o'clock was people were still sleeping, sadly. <laughs> And we think maybe that extra hour will make a difference. Um, and unfortunately, last year, we did have some rain um, in the last hour. So we were only able to have the event for actually two hours of some, you know, some decent walking around weather. And we did have a really good flow of students during those two hours. Um, so we really think that those three hours from 1 to 4 will be just fine. Um, after 4 o'clock, I'm sure they'll have other things to do. 
So um, also this year, the Chamber of Commerce has agreed to pick up the entire process of registering businesses. And I think that will help me a lot because some of the businesses were a little hesitant on agreeing to do an event like this. Um, I don't know if I sounded like I was 12 on the phone or <laughs> not legit, but um, I think that will help a lot also if they, if, um, they speak with Larry Payne directly. So, um, and also included, uh, you have in front of you the proposal that I did bring last year. And the last page, or uh, two pages, is a running list of the businesses that uh, were there. So if you have any questions, I could take. Oh, I also, lastly, um, we had the plan last time of a rainout location. And it was in Baker Center, but the more I thought about this, the more impractical it seemed. So instead, we picked a rainout date, and that will be on all of our advertising as um, October 4th. And the reason we pushed it, um, we gave it, we gave it a little time, bit of time between the 20th, so that if I had to change the date because of rain, I'd be able to re-advertise quickly um, for the October 4th date. So, but we're hoping. Usually, in you know, around that time, I, it was just a light drizzle last last time. So I'm hoping it'll be nice weather. But. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Do any of the council members have any questions? That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. But I just want to express again this year, I think last time folks said this as well, but it's really wonderful to see the student um, community reaching out to the larger Athens community. I think between um, Beautification Day and this project, it's, it's um, you know, building some really nice partnerships. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And we're really trying, we're, um, I'd like to see this become a student senate initiative also, so that once I'm, once I have left and, you know, started another life, <laughs> um, this will continue as, um, so every year that this will, you know, this will happen. And I'd like to see that because I could get bigger and bigger and bigger, and that'd be great. So I think okay. that's a great idea. Thank you. Very Thank much. you very um, much, Mayor um, Watt. I thought it was good. I attended it last year. Um, I noticed that actually there was a good um, percentage of businesses that don't really have shops. They're more like studios or crafts people as well. So I hope mm -hmm. we'll get more businesses actually that have places in there. Yeah. But what happened also was um, I think they fused it with the art fair. Mm -hmm. um, some of the People from the art fair um, called me instead of Carol and set up a table with me. And yeah, that was very nice to because that their displays were very elaborate and that brought a lot of students to the street. So we'd like to see them there again as well. But more businesses yeah. um, would be preferred. Do you have a please, do you have a maximum that you'd be wanting? I mean, uh, target number of uh, businesses. Um, well, I liked it. I really liked the location. It was just on South Court Street between Union and Washington, and I thought that it was a nice little area to handle. Um, we had a lot of space between tables, but I really would hate to exceed that area. So I want to see more than 60, but I don't want to s spend oodles of money on tables that <laughs> don't have to be there. So um, definitely more than 60 is my goal. Any other questions or comments? Or? Okay, great. Well, I think this is a great collaborative venture with the Chamber, and I'd appreciate your leadership on this. Yeah, thank you. So. Okay, uh, next is a uh, street tour summary, and council members did receive a copy of the PowerPoint that was distributed by uh, street director Andy Stone on the day that he conducted the tour for us, which was on March 5th, and we had a April 5th, yeah. a three-hour tour um, on the bus, and got to see lots of lots of streets and um, lots of situations that are needing attention. Uh, and there are three things that I think we would like to address tonight in in this um, street tour recommendation. Um, Andy gave us a sheet, which I thought was great, um, his philosophy on trying to be preventive about the street work that needs to be done and also being realistic, I think, about some of the things that are, some of the streets that are needing immediate attention. Um, we've got more streets in need than we have money, and which is often the case. And so we need to set uh, priorities. And 
Um, Andy shared with us the analysis that he does for the pavement condition ratings, and those are the, the ways in which he makes determinations on a scale using an ODOT designed rating system. And so he shared with us um, along the tour uh, some tentative sites that he has outlined um, that will be uh, streets that needing repaving. I, we do not have the final list right now, and so we won't be able to share that. Um, but uh, at the ordinance that he would like to have presented at next week's council meeting, he would have that final list to us before that ordinance is presented. And that ordinance would commit $300,000 towards uh, paving and street repairs. The other thing that he uh, shared with us that will be coming up by the time of the next committee meeting, so that would be two weeks from tonight, would be that we will need to look at a recommendation for the $300,000 commitment. This is another $300,000 allocation. And that would be for the next step of the design of the Richland Avenue 682 um, interchange. And historically, if I'm remembering right, this was part of, uh, this is not brand new money, but is part of what um, Andy had shared with us last year that this design of this intersection will take approximately $500,000. $200,000 of it was appropriated last year, I believe. So this is the second $300,000 increment um, for the uh, design stage. There's one other item, um, and uh, Councilmember Bain brought this up uh, this evening a little earlier, and this is the Grosvenor Street, and this was a site that we saw on the street tour. And um, it, it, there is a slip that's occurring there, and we uh, currently do not have an appropriation set aside or a, a firm plan for repair of that right now. As I understand, um, Street Director Stone has identified some possible FEMA funding money um, that would give us some money for mitigation of that slip. So what I'd like to request is that we have some additional details from Street Director Stone for our next committee meeting so that we could have some details on that, um, a little, perhaps a little bit of the history of that Grosvenor Street slip, which apparently has been a condition for a fair number of years, and then what our possible options are for, for repairing or at least beginning to, to address. We do have some design work that's been done f uh, for addressing that slip, so we'd like to see if we can move that forward probably on, on the priority list. I, I mentioned to Paul that there was, we initially had some some preliminary plans to do the slip, and we had a number on it. It was less than 300000 at that time. But it may not be usable anymore. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. I just have a quick question for the auditor. Um, I don't know offhand, and I don't know if you would, with, you know, just springing it on you like this, kind of roughly what the balance, the unappropriated balance is in the street fund. I'm sorry, I didn't bring anything with me. Okay. We um, should have unappropriated balance sheets next Monday. I, okay. Now I've that got, we've certified our January 1 resources, then we move forward from there, adding and subtracting appropriations, and um, we were actually working on that today. Okay. It's just a lot to move forward without seeing that. Right. Right. And there are, yeah, there's some funds and there's available. there's the wheel tax and other things like that, and I don't know where you're going to, how you're going to use those various piles of money with respect to the East State Street No, And so I was looking at that. There's a number, of, there are a number of different sources of revenue. I met with Street Director Stone this morning. He reviewed, he did just educating me, giving me background information, and provided with me some estimates on what they, the revenues would be, and understanding that they're just <coughs> estimates at this point um, that um, would come in for, um, yes, in, dif in different accounts, and that the permissive fee tax, also the gas tax revenue, and that these would total close to 700000 and then with the carry, the carry, not carryover, but unappropriated funds that might be still available. Um, 
yes, that, that we would have some funds. And then what we're talking about tonight then is committing 300,000 of that total then for the paving, 300,000 for the design, and then we would have to take a look at what's potentially available to allocate after those balances are taken off. The East State Street and all the rest. Yes, Councilmember Phillips. Um, this was actually discussed a little bit on last year's street tour, but I just don't want it to fall off our, our radar screen, which is the, um, we had a little bit of a discussion about brick streets on the street tour, and we had talked about it last year as well, and that there currently is an area that is, um, that council passed a resolution to keep um, in the historic district as, as brick, and then, um, Andy has also kind of gone through and looked at the rest of the brick streets in town to see which ones are in really good shape, which ones need some repair, and which ones are just in really bad condition. And um, we had some preliminary discussion about whether the ones that are in good shape um, we might want to add to that list that we, you know, commit to maintaining as brick. Okay. Just, you know, because, you know, aesthetically and because they last so much longer. It's, it, it, we had that discussion on right. the bus about it's, it may be more, um, it may cost more in terms of labor to actually do a really good job um, like they did on, uh, at college and West Union, the um, but then it lasts for much, much longer. And so over time, it's not uh, more expensive than asphalt. Yeah, thanks for the reminder on that, so we can keep that, yeah, keep that as a priority. Maybe you can get that slip for sure. okay. You remember the slip that we had last year? The list. The list, <coughs> yeah. And the ordinance, so we can look at it next, Actually, next time you have a meeting? Okay, for the next committee that. meeting, the last okay. ordinance. Okay. So we can... Yeah. So, Chris, I have a question. Actually, it's probably for the mayor. I did go over this list, and I don't think there's a single... didn't look to me like any Brick Street will be affected of the ones that we had talked about before. But I was wondering if South Blackburn from Albany Road to the Corp Line, if that's in conflict with the thing that I've been getting the full court press over, the um, South Blackburn <laughs> pertinence and the rest, I mean, would we, would we want to pay that if that's the pathway of the new water line? Okay, this is... <clears throat> Incompatibility, perhaps, South Blackburn from Albany Road to the Corp Line. I don't. I thought that was North Blackburn they were talking about. You were talking well, about it's South to go to go to the. I'm going to say that word again. The summit. It's going to have to. I, you're talking about a, a, a water line, are you talking? About yes, and I just is it going to go on the edge of the road? And I just wondered if the paving was compatible with it. Remember, this, this what he gave you was a possible list. It yeah. doesn't mean it's staying. Well, I just wondered if you, the administration could take a look at it and you before we have the final list okay. about that. In terms of South Blackburn and yes. North Blackburn. North Blackburn. Well, it, it, if, if it goes North Blackburn, it'll also probably have to go South Blackburn to go to the. I thought South Blackburn was on the other side of 50. Yes. Well, yes. I, I don't know. Wh I don't know what the. You know, I asked Crystal what, how extensive it was, because I heard, the only thing I've heard is the number, I don't know the path. Okay. She said there were three different paths. I just want to make sure this was compatible with that. Okay, in other words, we don't do it if we're going to start digging up. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a logical. Okay, I'll, I will talk to Andy and I'll talk to Nick and see, <clears throat> make sure they talk to each other. So or maybe One crystal. doesn't lay down asphalt and the other one digs it up. Yes, that's just um, what I was in, asking. In terms of the brick streets, I'm aware Andy's going to try to uh, apply again for the Carpenter Street brick area for issue one money this year. Last year we did not get it. We're going to take a shot at that. Um, as far as I know, no, none of these are brick streets right now. Yeah. It's, um, South May used to be. It was paved less than 20 years ago, and now it has to be paved again. <laughs> North May, on the other hand, was not paved, and the bricks were not removed, and it has not, does not have to be on the list. Have you all noticed that? <laughs> okay. And, and he does have that list. He does have that. I like brick streets too. I know. If we had the money to do all brick streets, it'd be great. Okay. We don't. I know. We don't. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the only complaint is you can't rollerblade on brick streets. Um, Life's a terrible thing sometimes. We build a skate park for that very reason. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yes. Back to South Blackburn, which I happen to live on. Um, if it gets paved, could it also be widened? 
widening bay. Yes. And South Blackburn is, I, I'm not sure where the tower is, where the reservoir is. Time it's, is up above it. It's, it's on, on up the street closer to the city limit line. It's uh, as you're driving up, it it's on forward, the left. So okay. I'm counting on you. A wider South Blackburn. Yes, please. Are there any other comments about the street tour or any other? Questions? Uh, briefly, Comment? I just mm -hmm. would like to add that uh, Andy Stone was, was very professional. I thought it was a well-organized and well-run street tour and, and very informative. It, it was, very. And he had quite oh, a crew yes. to put up with. <laughs> <laughs> a of well, I've done it in I, three hours. Yeah. I have a real quick request to make. Somebody's got a cell phone on silent, I think, and it's just... If you could just double check your cell phones. That's what that, I think what, that's what that noise is. Anyway, just a personal. Before leave meetings, I usually ask everyone. Turn I'd like to all thank the way off. Jan Hodson for the email that she did just sent us uh, regarding some discussion uh, earlier in the meeting. Oh, well, That'll so be some good news. Send texts to all of our constituents. Sometimes it is helpful. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, Bill. I just wanted to say one thing about Merkel Street. I don't know if you all know where it is, but it's oh, a brick yeah. street going down to East State Street. Well, at one point they dug up a corner of it, probably as big as the place where I'm sitting, and I had two calls before the day was don't over, and I had to call Andy. Don't you dare away. take those bricks out. You put them right back. And I said, oh, it's just repairs, repairs. So people, other people do feel passionately about it as well. Yeah. They are. They're, I think the bricks are a real asset to the city, as well as lasting a long time. Yeah. So, Well, we'll hear more about the street um, as we get the final list from uh, Director Stone and, and then also the ordinance then for the appropriation for the repairs. The next item is a transportation grant, and this is a renewal of an annual ordinance. And if I'm understanding it correctly, this is federal money that comes through the State Department of Transportation. And it's for assistance for fares um, for the elderly and disabled. And just wanting to bring this up tonight, that that will be an ordinance that will be presented next Monday night for consideration. And do we have any other miscellaneous items for transportation? Safety services. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to bring up the vehicle that uh, the fire chief has requested um, uh, that we purchase for him uh, to see what we would like to do. Would we like to go forward with that, or would we like to delay that uh, for perhaps another year? Anybody, Jim? Um, I'll just say that I was going to bring this up in miscellaneous that um, Councilmember Bain and I have been talking to the Deputy Auditor Ray Hazlett about funding the uh, the, ladder? the ladder truck the ladder that truck. is going to be needed within the next four years at a cost of 1.2 million right. to over a million dollars, and so we're we're hoping to be able to begin that annual contribution to build up and I guess beside the million two ladder truck and a and a, a station a, or a station wagon or something, maybe we ought to concentrate on the truck. On, 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 on the, the fire truck. truck. On the fire truck. The ladder truck. On the ladder truck instead of the that's yeah. The other thing that Ray said to me when I talked to him an hour before you talked to him was that um, Debbie probably mm -hmm. should be involved since she knows what she's doing. Oh, Ooh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, Debbie, our we Debbie. Went without <laughs> saying. Yeah, because uh, it's a compliment, Debbie. Not to be confused she's with the other Debbie. <laughs> well, that Debbie knows what she's doing, too. She was getting the budget. That was and, wonderful. And so that, was, that may or may not have any uh, relationship to to the uh, other request. But. For, the, for the chief's vehicle? Well, we, if I may interrupt, sure. uh, thank you. In all due respect also, I would, I would definitely would like to hear from the chief regarding his input and ideas regarding the needs 
uh, of priorities, whether it is a bigger priority for him uh, to have a renewed vehicle or whether the fire truck, the ladder truck, whether that is a necessity in the sooner or is it something that can be delayed, I'm not exactly sure, and whether or not there's other sources as well to help us support that, whether the university wants to assist in that process or not, I don't know. but. Um, I think that I'd like his, I would welcome his input as well. Would you all like the fire chief to be invited to a council meeting? The representative is right there. Um, the fire chief would indeed be like welcome, to welcome to the opportunity to come and speak with you. We are talking about replacing a 14 year old vehicle. Um, and I do understand that in the long term, and we're looking, which is coming up closer, the ladder replacement. Um, I view these as two separate things. So if you would. Uh, can indeed have the fire chief come and speak with you and present uh, uh, the planning for the future and also the need for this vehicle at this time. The 1994 GP uh, cannot in good conscience put any more additional repairs into it. So right now it, it runs as it runs and uh, it's hard when you get to that age of the vehicle to continue to put uh, additional resources into it. I think they've already replaced the motor, haven't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and some other things. And some other things. But it's, it's a lot of money to, to save in four years, so we need to start thinking about maybe um, having some money from, the, from uh, Ohio University. Is there any chance you think that we could? Yeah. <laughs> You're not Get giving some? salary increases. <laughs> what do you think? We, 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 Jim? Um, maybe I miss, remind me that the request, though, is to replace the chief's. He has requested his the vehicle that he's driving be replaced. I so, think it's about $33,000. Okay. And then that particular vehicle he's driving would pass down to right it would be it would, the, right it okay. would still what he's driving now would still be used by them would it, maybe when he comes he could t touch on this would it be less expensive just to replace the Jeep which is a smaller possibly less expensive vehicle yeah when and he would answer he would speak to this but the the issue was that uh, the equipment that may be needed, whether it be the river boat rescue or what have, needs to be able to be hauled, um, and so that's why he's chosen that's something big. more compatible that will be able to pull this equipment if needed. Right. So, okay. um, so we'll have two big vehicles that are high gas consumers, and you know, for one person because the rest of them are driving the fire trucks. So, I mean, you know, I'm back saying, well, okay, what's the argument? The, if, the, uh, if I may, um, Council Member Bain, the, uh, the 94 Jeep right now is remains at the original Henry station, station number two. So that's where it would go, as opposed to not well, the car Jeep driving. I'd just like to suggest that before this, we had, a, we had a traffic accident in Lancaster, the chief did, and we had only one vehicle. And so, you know, I mean, we're going to have two gas hogging vehicles then, basically in parked one in each station, potentially. I mean, what is, if we're going to have a policy of reducing our carbon footprint, maybe we just start here. Well, and that may be the case also. I don't know if um, Sherry was going to speak tonight about the police chief's uh, response coming back for a hybrid. And perhaps I Archie. thought maybe that Elahu was going to bring okay. that up in, during his committee. Oh, yes. uh, just briefly now. Um, uh, I guess and since, not just since you it, brought it up. I mean, and, and I just saw the email a couple hours before council, so I didn't really get a chance um, to look at it. Um, but basically, he said he's um, the police chief is, is willing to, to get a Ford Escape hybrid for one of their vehicles. Um, it's not the open bed truck that they had requested, right. as we heard tonight. It's, it's, of course, knows that the police community dialogue for different reasons they could use it, but willing to go ahead and take that step, and get it started. So. That's that's great news to me, yeah. as you all know. Good compromise, <laughs> Mr. Mayor. So uh, you would want the police chief at the next committee meeting? Do you all agree with that? Fire chief. Do you all agree with that? And that would be in May then, because we're on alternating schedules. Okay. okay. And uh, again, part of his uh, 
He's been willing to come any time. Um, he has. He has offered to come. <coughs> right. Yes. And, and so. I, I know he, really what he's talking about is the fact that he swaps out the cars every seven years. So the, the older ones just cycle down to the second tier. His, uh, his consideration is that um, he needs... He wants two vehicles because he has trailers in both stations now. Due to the fact that the repair of the previous station, station one, does not allow room for putting all the trailers in there. So there are, there are now two hubs, so to speak. And therefore, he wants to be able to haul uh, equipment from one or the other, depending on the need. That's, the, that's what he's told me. And if you look at the, at the vehicle list, everything else in the fire department is essentially uh, a fire truck. So we have one person with two vehicles. No, well, how many firemen do we have? I mean, they're otherwise driving around the trucks. So I'm going to. Well, then they don't Kruger. all drive around in trucks. Kruger's. Yeah, well, okay. Well, the seven year rotation is probably the chief's decision, not ours. I mean, I don't remember saying we're going to rotate him every seven years. And, no, that's true. And so, I mean, it's not like we said, okay, seven years, well, we're. On a different matter than I was asking the mayor a few minutes ago, also under safety services, for a long time, council thought, um, previous councils, one that's even moved to Texas, in fact, last week, we had this ongoing discussion about how important it might be to relocate and make a single fire station. And um, I was asking the mayor if he uh, had any idea of not necessarily asking an old fire chief, but going for someone who was a locational expert to talk about the potential for a single new fire station out by the bypass using that facility that we're maintaining now? And uh, can you come back and um, tell us what you think, if you have such a possibility? Okay, I'm aware that there was a study done by Kramer, was it? I, what, yeah, I, don't, I think you, what you really need and what I was hoping you would think about is somebody who's an expert in location, not in staffing. We don't, I mean, I'm not interested in the staffing component at this point. You're interested in location. In location, yes. There are such people who would talk about facilities location. Probably we, give us. We're not talking about Morris Avenue, are we? No, we're okay. talking about Pocomire <laughs> probably. I know they do it for sure. And there are some others, too. And which property? I'm sorry. I, I don't know that I have a property in mind. I okay. don't have one to sell, but I just would like to know if we have. I mean, it seems that there is at least a possibility that a single station. Yeah, right. It's got a great garage, but it wouldn't fit a fire truck. Okay. So will you check into that? I will check into that. Okay, great. Thank you. Anything else? I would add um, regarding the, 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 fire, the chief's request for a new vehicle. There are um, alternatives as well to, to what he has submitted, um, and, and that can be discussed later. But the Chevy does make a, a hybrid eight-cylinder vehicle, which costs more, but it is a hybrid. Um, so in the long run, it would be something that would, would get better gas mileage and would pollute less. So it is something for us to consider in the long run it would be using less gasoline and polluting less. But it, it's actually beyond what he's requested. It would cost more um, in the short term. But in the long term, it would be something that would probably be advantageous. So I guess this would be something for us to discuss at length as well with him present. Well, he had mentioned um, flex fuel but it's my understanding that we don't have access to That's right. fuel with ethanol in it. So The vehicle he proposed was a flex fuel accepting mm -hmm. vehicle. If you read Time Magazine, they tell you that ethanol is a bogus, right? Last week, isn't that what they said? More energy is spent yep. creating. Yes, creating. exactly yep. right. So um, let's not talk about ethanol as a, as a solution, guys. Right. Okay. Well, I think flex fuel is not just ethanol. Are we on the community? Can you remember what we were going to do in the community? Oh, we're, um, Jim and I were, I put it on here because Jim and I were talking to Beverly about um, potentially working through um, the issues with respect to pay 
in the city, but we had some issues that we felt we needed to pursue first. So maybe sometime in the future we'll find out who got us an increase and who didn't and what we need to do about it. And that's... And then a couple of miscellaneous yeah. uh, with regard to community issues. Um, Chris Nisley spoke to us as a as a, as a citizen uh, quite a while ago about um, the growing problem of graffiti within the city. And um, <clears throat> we've asked a law director to <clears throat> give us some feedback on, in, on the use of volunteers to clean up graffiti on the restrictions regarding cleaning it on private property versus public property and um, Chris has had some discussions with with the law director um, he's not here tonight and and we don't have anything really to put in front of you but she was going to take a minute to talk about a few of the things that you've already mm -hmm. heard from him Yes, he has looked at some legislation, one of which is in Dublin, Ohio, and in this particular ordinance in Dublin, it makes the uh, responsibility of removing graffiti uh, would be the responsibility of the owner. Mm. And so we've also, in fact, we talked with Captain Pyle tonight at the Community Police Dialogue, and his concern and has been and was, it still is, that we not punish the victim in this case. So uh, we need to be looking at the legislation and I think careful to, if we do set it up as a responsibility of the owner to clean, the, to remove the graffiti, that we would want to set um, an, an adequate time limit for somebody to be able to clean it up. And then uh, possibly if they don't, then maybe setting up some kind of mechanism where the city could come in and if if they had to then remove the graffiti then be you know put a fee back on it some something like the lawn mowing um, that sometimes happens with the city so we we need to look at the different ordinances that are out there and in, in in other cities and uh, take into into consideration those concerns um, for you know property owners and begin to address it. So our hope is is that we can get some of that draft legislation comments from Law Director Lang yet hopefully this this week and be able to come back uh, to the committee fairly soon with some dra a draft ordinance. We're, we're also, I, I just might add, it's not only just an ordinance or, or in addition to the ordinance, we were looking at a, you know, the cleanup teams, also um, prevention and we're also looking at education. So we're trying to make it a multifaceted approach to the graffiti. And um, I'll be following up with Amanda Eastock, I think on Student Senate too, because she would be, her committee would be the Community Affairs Committee. And so maybe we can, I'd like to get some input from students as well. I think that would be important. Um, you all got in your box the communication tower com that I worked with um, Ron Forrest on, and so Paul's going to be asking us, or the mayor's going to be asking us for a, a, a contract with IntelliWay. So you, if you would put this in your folder for future reference, go over it. Um, uh, basically, um, the potential to add a, a user and some of the things that we brainstormed before meeting on Thursday, I did with Ron Forrest, and the, the result is here. And you can look and see if there's anything else you think we should add. Um, this is uh, something to go over. And then um, secondly, he also said we should add the leaseholder agrees not to interfere with any of the city's communications equipment within the city limits or the three-mile planning jurisdiction as well. So I think he's got every single angle. I had the three-mile in my notes, but I couldn't figure out what it was. Is this from you? No, that, yes, from me. Okay. Butler. Thank you. If I could comment briefly again on the graffiti issue, if I may return that just real briefly. Um, I would like to see us perhaps consider some designated areas for expression um, as a city. I mean, not necessarily similar to what the university has with their wall for 
for expression. I'd like to maybe see the city consider. It may not happen, but I'd like there to be a little bit of a dialogue or discussion for some, maybe some areas. Um, I don't know if that would be a part of this dialogue or discussion or debate, but. I assume it would be part of the dialogue, uh, yes. Uh, now, I don't know if it's going to be one of those not in my backyard kind of cases. Well, I was thinking in your backyard, actually. <laughs> I, I'm all for uh, freedom of expression and, and, and art, but um, I'm a, go ahead. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, I think that would be good to discuss it. From what, from what the reading I've done on the different community awareness websites, the, um, some of the recent trends are saying that when you designate an area, it actually increases the graffiti. And I think if you look at OU's experience with a graffiti wall, while it's beautiful um, from week to week and varies, and I love to walk up by it and read it, the um, graffiti has now spread to the Richland Avenue Bridge, to the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and to the other blocks, to the um, waste containers, to the Athens News, you know, newspaper containers too. So I don't know if that's hmm. uh, th that ends. So, but I, and I would just offer that comment back. But I think we, I would agree. I think it's a good idea. To well, I'd like it. to see some of that data. I'd, I'd be curious okay. to. To, I'll, find the, I'll find the reference for you. That's a good point, though. It needs to be part of the discussion, I think. Yeah. And, and so what we're doing here, we, we have several issues that have come before us and been mentioned, but um, we have no resolution to offer this evening um, with regards to the graffiti and, and the city's actions toward removing it. Um, we have heard from many sources that the sooner it is is removed the, the less likely more is to occur but there needs to be the manpower and, and unfortunately the, the money involved to, to make that happen so we hope that that can come with an ordinance soon um, and Council Member Baines uh, mentioned of the, the uh, private transmitters using our cell towers um, is a fairly urgent issue also. There are, there are um, some unauthorized uses going on right now, and we need to deal with those. And I just passed around another uh, piece of paper um, that our um, clerk of council has pulled up. We had some time ago, actually under a previous administration, and we probably need copies of this, um, we had um, lost the part-time um, animal control officer to retirement that we've had in conjunction with the, with the county. And there was discussion on replacing that person or going to some other um, agreement. And what's happened is nothing. And about a month ago, we maybe even longer, we had a, a small dog running into traffic on my area of East State Street, and I called the, the pound, and they said, we don't patrol Athens anymore, and I, the, the police do. So I called the police department, and the dispatcher said, I don't know who handles that, but I'll have someone call you back. Well, the next day I got a <laughs> call from somebody who said, we don't really do that. We don't have anybody who's trained to do that. And Thank goodness somebody came and got that dog and got it out of there before it was um, harmed. And so um, I ask again, you know, we, we look at what's happening in other cities. So I asked Debbie Walker if she could research this. And she, she looked at the Ohio Revised Code. And if, if you look at that sheet that I gave you right there in the middle, um, under municipalities, it, it says that um, revised code requires a county dog warden to patrol within the municipalities contained within the county and to impound dogs found running at large. Um, so we should have some coverage from the county dog warden. Um, we are having to deal with what's the definition of patrol, I guess. Um, what, is that, what does that really mean? And then there are other issues that we might 
wants a dog warden to, or an animal control warden to deal with. And the county has um, made an offer that we could uh, join with them for full coverage at, at an annual cost of $25,000. And that's what I said that the previous administration had considered that, but thought that we needed to answer some other questions, one of which, how much money do license fees from the city bring to the county? Again, um, our clerk, Debbie Walker, went to the auditor's office and found that um, so far in 2008, the estimated license fees for city tags alone are $41,000. Wow. So city residents are contributing a fair amount to um, the animal control effort. And the, and the pound, um, a lot of that money goes to the pound, I do realize that. But this is an, um, an issue that, again, I'm offering no resolution, no ordinance at this time, but I'm giving you information that we have gathered, again, to think about for two weeks, and then we need to come back to this and maybe make some decision. I just have a quick question. The part that it um, refers to here about um, <clears throat> the county and the municipality may contract for additional services or um, additional enforcement, do we have city code related to animal control beyond um, bringing in dogs that are and cats that are running at large? Do we currently have anything in our code that our animal control officer was enforcing that would not be covered by Ohio Revised Code. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Probably leasing uh, leashes on dogs would be something above what's required in the county. I don't know. Is there something in the county says every, every dog has to be on a chain in the county? I think it has to. Large. It is. I think they do require. It. Not that they really do. Okay. And barking dogs. And barking dogs. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know. Okay. We'll, we'll need to look at our code and see. But um, I was um, interested in some similar questions, and I asked Debbie to call Chillicothe and Lancaster, and I actually went to Knox County and asked because my daughter lives in Mount Vernon, and the dog warden is always around, and you know, so there's no separation between city and county. In each case, there was no separate. Ordinance. Contract, right. There's no separate contract. No separate contract, pardon me. And the, the other thing I think that if we're going to go into this, we need to ask is um, that they would collect also the appropriate amount of kennel fees. My understanding is if there's a financial problem, the kennel fee designation is an issue at, at this point. And I'd like to explore that further. And the other, the other thing is the historical reason for Lana is that we, if you go back and look at what's going on in Morgan County, you would find that we had something similar to that going on here. I'm not going to mention it out loud in public, but there was some pretty poor um, humane treatment going, or lack of humane treatment. And Lana certainly, to her credit, exemplified it and got it implemented at the dog shelter, where it hadn't been necessarily a priority. And um, the cats were held by the, were done by the Humane Society. And, and that was a decision that was made to instill a humane treatment approach at that point in time. And she stayed with us because it worked out, I think, over time. And um, she was an exemplar of that, and I have to give her credit for it. But I, you know, it's, that's why I, when the mayor last time said, well, you know, we didn't, they didn't think we needed it, or so on and so forth, I, maybe we have implemented humane treatment. The other thing that I would add is every Friday I look at the dogs in the paper and decide if I really want one mm -hmm. or not. But I notice that almost all of them are found at large in county locations, not in the city. And um, that's just something to think about. Found at the McDonald's in Nelsonville. This little tyke came from Gloucester. You know, so on and so forth. So I At this point, they're not patrolling within this. Right. And the, it's when I go out to Heiner's to get bread for the food pantry, you see dogs at large on the plains all the time. Do you see them in the city? Not very often. I mean, I think that we have a different clientele. I guess I can say that. Um, again, more questions to answer. So uh, um, we'll look at the city code and see what was, what is in there, and what 
isn't being enforced at this moment. I'm awfully vocal, but let me just say that Los Angeles is adding spay and neuter to its ordinances right now. Really? They're requiring spay and neutering of pets in Los Angeles. We were just a couple years ahead, thanks to Kate McGuckin. <laughs> It's now crashed and burned, I know. Oh, shame we could make it <laughs> does, uh, does any of the money... Um, I'm sorry, did you... Does any of the money, uh, um, is it appropriate towards cat or cat shelter as well? Or is there any... Because I know that that's an no. issue that's been raised to me by cats. West Siders that, cats a problem. that we have a concern with cats and their need to be receiving care. No, there's no tags. Right, there's no tags. No, no registration, which, which does okay. which does um, yield a cash flow to solve the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So um, check that kennel thing though. If you're our deputy on this, if you're our point guy, will you? Okay. I. It's have, an auditor's I an email, decision. I have that email. Also. I believe the county auditor made a decision to handle it a certain way, and I think that other counties handle it slightly differently. Okay. And I'd also like to see the cats taken care of as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've done a lot of miscellaneous money. with community well, issues. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to, I've warned you, I might throw in a finance one. Well, so, here we go. Um, actually, the auditor is here. Um, we have, we pay a fairly large amount for uh, workers' compensation each year, and currently we have appropriated 500 and some thousand dollars for 2008. Uh, we have received our bill from the workers' comp department. It's um, somewhat more than that. <laughs> and as maybe new council members don't know, but several years ago we had um, an accident which involved a fatality, a terrible accident, and and we were told that our rates would go up for a while before they began to level off. And we're still in the rising stage. So, um, Auditor Heck, do you want to go from there? We we have appropriated five hundred and some thousand dollars. We have. I um, this just came up today when we got our bill, and it's due May fifteenth. But I thought the sooner I brought it to you, we could start this through, we need additional um, appropriations. And so um, I copied these papers after I got here and, and just gave them to Nancy and, and Jim. But um, we have about 26 uh, accounts here that we need an additional appropriation to cover these expenses. Now, the reason we would like to do this is because we pay, this is sort of an early bird payment that we pay our entire costs uh, in the spring and we get a rebate, a discount of 3%, which that would add up to about $21,000. Um, we've always done that, and so um, naturally I'd like to just do that and save us some money, but um, we did, we had appropriate about 590000 almost 591000 We need another 114000 appropriated. But as I said, that's divided up among 26 different account lines. I think I said funds a minute ago, but it's account lines. Because the workers' the compensation uh, depends on account lines who have employees who are covered by that, which we all are. And as Jim stated, our, our you know costs have risen, and we've gotten our estimated cost, our rate for next year, and it's it will go up again. We've already, they've already given us that, so we're still on that plan. It'll be over one percent. Our rate will be from what it is now for next year. So. President Biden. I've managed businesses for a number of years that uh, have had to manage workers' comp as a major component of their budget. You know, I've seen a uh, nursing home before doing a real workers' comp aggressive management of the cases go from $400,000 for a 100-bed nursing home down to less than 100000 if it's well done. And that takes a lot of work and really making sure that 
everything's being questioned every step along the way for you know people that are claiming workers' comp injuries and uh, uh, following a lot of guidelines, you know, uh, instituting uh, a lot of drug testing and uh, those kind of things. Are we doing everything that we should be doing? Do we have a consultant that is literally walking us through everything that can be done? Because I have seen tremendous savings. I can't believe on 200 and some covered employees, $700,000 is the best we can do. And one case will have a uh, certainly an impact, but usually after four years, the mouse has gone through the snake, so to speak, and that's gone. So that should not, well, we Jim should not continue to be going up. I called him as soon as I was made aware of this, and um, we're not sure where we are on that four year thing. Um, I'm not sure it was only four years. I do know that it didn't start as soon as we had our, you know, event mm -hmm. that put us on a different track here. Um, so, yeah, I think we might be heading into our fourth year. Um, but Kathy, I, I can't believe I tried to it. call somebody, and I, I I'm, will look into that, but I don't know where we are on that. I do know that, um, you know, Beverly Henderson is doing a lot of things. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what needs to be done. Okay. I'll try finding out. I do not know myself. And maybe I can have some quality time with you and Beverly sometime to at least bring up the things that I'm very used to being done okay. and uh, you know because I cannot believe seven hundred and three thousand dollars is uh, uh, a proper number mm -hmm. you know but we saved uh, 20 percent by instituting drug testing you know at hire after every uh, injury and 20% uh, of the people uh, every year. And that went for everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm not too sure that the people sitting on this d dais would not be uh, required to submit to random drug test, you know, to get the savings that the Bureau of Workers Comp uh, allows. I know the Bureau did require us to, to institute a wide range of safety classes, which happened and, and are recurring annually. Um, I don't know what else other requirements were put upon us, but I, again, I'm, I'm relatively certain we're doing everything they've told us, but maybe there are things that we haven't asked. You don't, you don't always know until you ask. So. Mm -hmm. Um, a conversation with the President Bias it might be a good, yeah, uh, good idea it. at this point, but it's not going to no, reduce not this, year's, this year's, this no. year's no. request. Okay. So no. we need no, to, no. we'll see this ordinance come up next week. We will need to suspend it at second reading. To, if, assuming we want to make the payment on time so that we do receive the the discount, which in this case would be would be twenty one thousand dollars and some change. I'm sorry. Did I? Has anybody double checked with the Bureau of Workers Comp about the rate, the amount, the bill? I haven't heard about this. First, I heard about it because tonight. when I get a bill, you know, and it's higher. I mean, I know it's different on a different level, but you know, just to just to ask for an explanation of you know if it has been the four years and why it continues to increase when we have been implementing safety. Well, measures. we knew it would be at least four years or more that they would increase it, and that's why I don't think it feels like it's been long enough to us. But I don't think it has. But but as I said, yes, we've already been notified by the Bureau of Workers' Comp, and and our rate will go up next year also. Um, to it's what, seven point nine percent will go up over eight percent to over eight. They've already told us for 2009 what our rate will be, so we are okay. still on that plan. You know. Okay. Is there is there someone at the bureau that that you can talk to? I can to ask. Or I can talk to Beverly about it. Okay. Um, we pay the bills. We got we got the bill. We've been notified what our rates are going to be. 
but as far as what we're supposed to be doing as a city, that's um, handled that's, by Beverly. That's, that's not you. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. We're hitting the wrong person yeah. with the questions. So, okay, we'll, uh, we'll ask a few more questions before next week. Yeah. Okay. I'll try to get in on Wednesday. Okay. okay. And that is all the news that we have. Environment. Environment committee is up. Um, there is one item on the agenda for the environment committee, and unless anyone has any miscellaneous, so as keeping in mind the rising fuel costs and the city's commitment to reduce our impact on green on global warming and greenhouse gas emissions, um, I've been trying. I know other council members have also supported um, and shared the goals of, of getting more efficient vehicles in the city um, where we can afford it, and also just in general reducing um, the amount of fuel that we're using. I, I think we spent about $22,000 last month on fuel, um, which which is a lot, and it's probably only going up. Um, I've got a handout here. This is on the front, and I, I'm sure to copy or two, so excuse me for that. Um, on the front there is two sheets. It's sort of a description of what um, what a Green Fleet's policy is. And this comes from the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, ICLEI, um, which is an organization that works with cities across the world on, on different ways that they can uh, reduce their um, <laughs> reduce their impact on global warming. Right sizing vehicle fleets by downsizing and Yeah, as, as you can see, I highlighted right on the front page there. Um, this would put in place a framework within the city. Um, a lot of it would have to be at the administration level, obviously. Um, what it would do is, is set a baseline for where we are right now with our vehicle fleet, um, the amount of fuel we're using. It would uh, set targets based on that baseline for, for reductions and outline different ways that we might be able to reach those reductions. Um, for example, uh, right sizing vehicle fleets, so making sure, as came up earlier, ensuring that we're, we're using the smallest, uh, most efficient vehicles possible for a given job. Um, optimizing vehicle travel and maintenance, I, I don't know that that's much of an issue, but it might be somewhere where, where the city could work in, in some ways. Public um, entity should be accountable for auton traffic, travel. And, and also little things, efficiencies within the, within the city that, that we might be able to work on within city government. Um, and also listed on there are a couple other things like alternative transportation, alternative vehicles. And there's more ideas on the back, um, but this isn't meant to be an in-depth discussion tonight. I also attached a model ordinance, um, which would have to be custom tailored to the city of Athens. Um, but if council members are interested, if you could read through that at some point in the next uh, couple weeks, um, just to sort of get, a, get acquainted with, with what this would set up. One of the biggest things that this would do would be set up a Green Fleet Review Committee, um, and this would be setting up another committee within the city. Um, we would raise your eyebrows on that one. There's not enough committee. Um, and and so it it will be some additional work that the city will have to do um, if we decide to go this route. And I guess at this point, I'm I'm interested in hearing if there's support for proceeding with with this kind of um, ordinance or. If if people think that we might be able to achieve these things in some other way um, rather than go through an ordinance process. Um, my first thought when you said the thing about creating a new committee is whether the um, Cool Cities resolution that we passed, do we have a group that's already working on implementation there and whether these really are very similar goals? So. Um, even if we would um, pursue a resolution stating this as a specific policy goal, it seems really related to the Cool Cities project that we're already engaged in. It is. Uh, it, it is very closely related. Um, I guess just to clarify, was what what if we did pass an ordinance here um, that's based on the model ordinance that that I got from this organization? Um, the committee that it would set up would be um, similar to the Shade Tree Commission um, in that it would oversee um, purchase requests for vehicles within the city. So they would come to this committee for review before they come to council. So we, we wouldn't have the discussions like we had earlier um, about the fire department's vehicle. Those, each department within the city would, would present a plan for replacing their vehicles um, and 
that would be approved by the committee, which would be made up mostly of people within the city administration, um, I would assume, and hopefully with one or two others that would be able to add some, some important input. I, I guess if I could ask um, the mayor to maybe forward a copy of this model ordinance to your different departments for some feedback. Okay. Um, that would be helpful I can from, do that. from my end here. Uh, we belong to this organization, and we, we haven't do. done anything with the Cool City so far. I know there's discussion about having a, uh, when I say I haven't done anything organized, because we have been doing stuff along the way in terms of, uh, you know, lighting and stuff like that. Um, right. I know there's a discussion of getting an intern for checking out greenhouse gases within the city administration buildings, all the buildings alone, and getting a benchmark on that. I can bring this up to staff and have them look at it and see where we want to go with it. Um, the biggest impediment I see right now is to cycle out the, the gas guzzlers and what to replace it with and the expense of that. Right. Um, there, there are lots of places we can do this. I mean, um, you know, uh, right now the car at the service safety director's um, abilities to use are as an, an old Impala. Uh, it's much better than a Crown Vic. It's not the Explorer that everybody calls a beast uh, within our departments. Um, that's sitting someplace, I hope, getting uh, cobwebs on it <laughs> at streets. Um, it's useful during a snow emergency, but that's about right. it. We have a series of Crown Vicks. You know the inventory as well as I do. And the next question is how do we, you know, we can, we can get rid of these. Uh, then the next question is getting the money to replace them. I mean, I, uh, the car I have at my disposal is either the Beast or I, I get the Impala from her for that. Uh, or I take my own, my choices. Um, to say, I, I see that I'd like to, I know I discussed earlier about trying to get a Prius for the code because they need a new car. There's money in the budget, about 20000 for doing that. It will cost more than that. But to start phasing out cars, a lot of it has to do with what the use of the cars are. Many of the vehicles are specific for hauling things. I mean, the pickup trucks can change, but there aren't that many pickup trucks that are much, much more fuel efficient than what's out there right now. I know because I've looked. Um, in terms of just the, the driving around cars, the Crown Vicks and the Impalas are the next ones to go if we want to do it that way. But again, every you know we could downsize the fleet to a certain amount. Last year, if you look at the numbers and you have them as well as I do, they dropped off about 15 uh, vehicles total. So that was a good chunk already. Uh, the next one after that is what are we replacing? You know, and who who gives up the cars? And I'm working on that. So I'll pass this along. But as an organizing committee maybe a little bit more difficult than you think because at that point you'll have a bunch of vested interests administration saying you know that department needs to eliminate theirs but don't touch mine yeah i, I understand the okay the issues that can come with that um this this is based on something that's been proven in a, a large number of communities i don't have the exact number right here mm -hmm. um, but this a very similar policy and um to to what's outlined and in, in what i handed out has worked and they've they've shown um year-to-year -year reductions in, in fuel use um, based on this, this type of an oversight where you set specific targets mm -hmm. and then you measure every year and have, have a, a ability to, to really keep track of exactly what's being used where and um, how to possibly decrease, decrease that. I look at this as more part of the, uh, the Cool Cities initiative. It, uh, this would be a component yeah. of more. A standalone committee may be too much, but because really I want to get a committee for the Cool Cities itself. Um, again, the discussion that's been going on within the within the city emails flowing back and forth is, okay, if we get an intern to look at all the buildings and do it, and we have code for doing energy audits, we have two code officers trained for that. Um, do we have them start working on all the buildings? Um, do we have somebody start looking back at the historical uh, energy costs over the years to see where we've been going up or down? Um, but the part of it would be this, not just a standalone, because it's all one component, uh, a mixed component. You know, the discussion right now is, you know, how about a, a new air conditioning and, and heating unit or air conditioning unit at the uh, Arts West, you know, and then it comes down to money on that. Uh, a more efficient one for the law administration bill in terms of heating and, and cooling. And, and I, should, I should probably mention that, um, yeah, I wasn't sure that establishing a committee would work um, given the size of our town and, and sort of the na nature of, of Athens mm -hmm. and the uniqueness of it. Um, but I, I think if we can find some way to work work through the goals that are outlined in here. And they do lie um, directly in line with the cool cities. So. Okay, yeah. I would say uh, Andy's contact for this, this membership that we have, as well as myself, 
Um, but again, we haven't really sat down and discussed it as much as I'd like to at this point. We have lots of other things on our plate. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I guess for now, I'll continue sort of an informal discussion amongst council and also city um, employee uh, administration employees. I'll just say that um, recently, when we've um, been asked to act on some requests from the police and the fire department, my comment was that you know, these requests are based on um, what's happening right now with regards to price and, and availability of cars. And we haven't had a policy like this. And I, actually, I think that's exactly what we do need is, mm -hmm. is a policy establishing uh, benchmarks and goals and, and, um, and some kind of um, way to um, evaluate choices. And so right now is the time I think we need to do this. Um, we've kind of gone, we've, we're moving or have moved past those, those time frames, time limits for um, the state buying lists. And so before we get to that point again, it's the time to put this in. So I think it's a good idea. Uh, sure. With, I, I, I agree. Yeah. We need a policy before we face this again. I, I think it could be very helpful for us, at least. Right. It, it would make more work for the city administration. Um, but then I, I think it would ensure that our city money is well spent when it comes to fuel and vehicles. I, I too, uh, voice my support and appreciate your work in gathering this information. I think it's the responsible thing to do, both environmentally and fiscally. I think the city in the long term could, could uh, and the citizens will reap, reap a lot of benefit. Thank you. Anything else on Green Fleets? And miscellaneous for anyone? I, um, the Planning Commission will be reviewing the Wellhead Protection Ordinance revisions as recommended by um, Mike Cooper and Crystal Kennard on Thursday. Eventually, they will be coming up to Council for adoption. Um, Councilmember Bain had requested that I also have the original uh, ordinance draftees, drafters, review that too in case there are additional changes to be included. Thanks. Um, just because I'm new here, do any changes to the Wellhead Protection Ordinance need to go through the planning? Uh, it commission? says so in the draft that I have, which was kind of questioning that said any changes would be uh, recommended by the Planning Commission. Thanks. Again, back to you for adoption. I think that's in the present code. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think under Ohio Revised Code, there's a relationship with our zoning code between Planning Commission and, and Council, but I think the um, Wellhead Protection Ordinance was just an ordinance that was passed by Council um, when that originally came through. So, I mean, I don't have any problem with, with other bodies kind of looking at stuff and making recommendations to us, but I don't think that the Planning Commission would have to review changes before they were made. That's, I mean, I'll have to, to look at that, but that's <coughs> my understanding is that for um, you know zoning changes and things like that have to go kind of back and forth between Planning Commission and Council, but I don't think other sections of our code have to do that. I'll, I'll double check um, the ordinance itself and make sure that um, I'll, I'll double check it and, and see if it does call for planning commission review. And if it does, that would be something that council could change, I assume. Um, review is okay. Yeah. Review versus a, a recommendation. Approval. That we have to do four to three. I was under the impression it required us to make the changes and give it to you guys. Uh, but I don't know if it requires a supermajority. I don't think it's under the same zoning code, if that's what you mean. Same requirements. It may have been the last time when we had that um, overlay thing. That would mean land development ordinance, which we explicitly left outside the zoning ordinance. <laughs> would, for all the good. Uh, for all the right reasons. <laughs> yeah, it would fall in the same category. And I don't think that was ever our intention. I think even the minutes should reflect that. I, I, and part of the reason I'm 
bringing this up is I've been concerned in looking at the wellhead protection ordinance about whether when we um, the last time we went through we talked about um, lawn maintenance and the use of least toxic biological substances within the wellhead protection area and I'm not sure I think we meant that to apply to everybody who was using those kind of substances and I'm not sure that um, it it accomplished that so that's an area that I wanted to council to look at again so if there's going to be a discussion about wellhead protection if you're going to make some recommendations to us please look at that um, I actually was looking at some of the last when you, you sent it to us um, when we got it I find some of the wording confusing in terms of the exceptions in the first preamble and uh, so I think that it, it needs to be clarified and it would be better if all seven of you are looking at this and the five uh, committees, commission members. I'll try to be there. I was okay. drifting off. Can't hear him. Hmm? You were drifting. I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, well, okay, the language really? needs to be brushed up, right? The bottom line. The language line. needs to be brushed up a okay. lot. A lot. Okay. okay. We're in agreement exactly on that. Okay. No. And, and we, there also, I noticed when I was looking through it, um, there may have been some. Um, going from a draft to an ordinance, there may have been some inconsistencies with numbering and referencing different segments, so that might need to be cleaned up just a little bit. Um, is, is there any action I need to take now on the water protection issue? I know you guys will be looking at it, and I, I appreciate you doing that and getting some of the former uh, people that were working on it before together to do that. Um, and we'll also, I will forward it to everyone. Um, that, I assume everyone will want a copy. I can make sure everyone gets a copy so you can look through it uh, yourself. And we'll look to making changes, um, the, needed, the needed changes for that in the future. Just one thing. Are we, we're talking about Muriel Grimm and Heather Cantino, aren't we? And Kathy. You said Kathy yeah. Hecht. And you gave Kathy Hecht. You gave me the three people. Oh, I don't remember. Oh, yeah, because okay. she was on. Okay, okay. got it. All right. and, and I've met with Heather and Muriel already um, to do okay. just a preliminary um, review of it. Some other people there too. All right. I am adjourned. You don't have to. I mean, the third one is not mine. Okay. She was the one who shepherded through the first time. Yeah, she was the um, councilman. Yeah. Are we adjourned? Yeah. We're My committee just is ran out of steam. <laughs> no, I'm asking. I, I, <laughs> no, I, meant to, I feel the same way. I'm going like, Ooh. I'm not running out of steam. I just. Um, you saw my hand. Let me show you. Drifting off.